Welcome to this soul-lifting broadcast which has been put together for your spiritual growth and to make greatness come on right where you are. Be sure to make the best of this moment as God takes the lead in all that concerns you. Praise God. Matthew chapter 20, verse 25, 26, and 27. Matthew chapter 20, verse 25, 26, and 27. But Jesus called to them, called them to himself, and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Jesus here defined what it means to be great. A church has a mandate from God to make greatness come on. We're here to create a conducive environment for greatness to evolve in the life of everyone that God will send to us. And our definition of greatness is service. Living a life of impact through service. What I'm saying this morning is that we must seek to localize this definition of greatness. Just to how it affects our nation. And how we participate in nation building. Because that's where we need it the most right now. That's where we need it the most. The church seems to be lagging behind. You know, before now, I used to be angry when people bash the church and say things like, you know, everything that's wrong in Nigeria, they blame pastors for it. So educational system is bad, and the, but the pastors are not doing anything. Political system is the pastors. Initially, I used to be angry until I got the memo from the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So why shouldn't they blame you? <laughs> and then I calmed down. Now I manage my hunger better. Because the truth is that God put us here as preservatives to preserve our world from decadence. So if anything is going wrong, they should blame us. We're supposed to shine our light so that darkness can disappear. Poverty is darkness. Yeah. Jesus said in John 10, 10, the enemy has come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And that sounds like poverty. Poverty is destructive. He said, I have come that you may have life and have it in abundance. Amen, somebody. That sounds like light. So they cannot com continue to list us as one of the poorest nations in the world and 61% of our citizens living below the poverty line, whether the United Nations definition or any other definition, poverty is poverty. Yeah. It means that our light is not making the right effect. And it means that our salt is losing its savor. And that's why it looks like the church has been thrown underfoot. Yeah. We have to come out from the gutter. And be the light and be the salt. It's about accepting our responsibility for greatness, true greatness, which is service. Which is service. We have to accept that responsibility for true greatness, which is service. In Genesis chapter 12, uh, God called Abraham, come out from your people, you know, from your land, and go to a place that I will show you. And he said, I will make of you a great nation. Genesis chapter 12 from verse 1. Can, can you put, it up, put that up for me? He said, I will make of you a great nation and, uh, and you shall be a blessing and, um, and make your name great. Yeah. Make your name great, make of you a great nation and you shall be a blessing. That's the, 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 the calling of God upon Abraham. And if we are children of Abraham, that means it, it should reflect through us. Am I saying the truth this morning? Yeah. It should reflect through us. Jesus then came and said, uh, true greatness is service. So, Greatness starts with self-leadership. It starts with self-leadership. In the course of this month in our midweek services, uh, we will be teaching leadership. We'll have some short leadership seminars just to reinforce this a little further. But suffice it to say this morning that greatness starts with self-leadership. In Proverbs chapter 6, when you read from verse 6 down to 11, Proverbs 6 and verse 6 down to 11, it says, go to the hands, 
you sluggard. Consider our ways and be wise. Verse 7 says, Who having, uh, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides a supply in the summer and gathers a food in the harvest. I mean, if I don't even read any further, it says, we should observe from the ant. The big question I always ask whenever I read this scripture is, how big is the brain of an ant? Even the ant itself. And we carry something that is quite sizable. Yeah. And God says we should observe. <laughs> we should observe from the ant. Yeah. The ant, therefore, maybe some of that day I'll be able to expand on it a little more because I have a lot more to say as we teach leadership, you know, in the other services. The ant, as small as it is, has a special grace and gift from God to fend for itself and solve its own problem. Without guide, overseer, or ruler. Meanwhile, we are always looking for somebody to blame. <laughs> leadership and true greatness starts with self-leadership. Starts with self-leadership. You can't lead yourself. I mean, if you can't lead yourself, you won't be able to effectively lead others. If you have not solved problems for yourself, it's difficult to solve problems for other people. Am I saying the truth this morning? So greatness starts with self-leadership, solving your own problems, and then solving problems on a massive scale for other people. One of the major issues that we have in our politics in Nigeria is that we have loads of people who have not solved their own problems trying to solve problems for us. Yeah. And who are not used to solving problems for, for other people until they're getting into politics. People that we cannot trace any value that they've added to our economy. Their contribution to the GDP of Nigeria before politics. We can't trace anything. And yet, they want to lead us to grow the same GDP. So greatness comes through serving others. And to be effective in service, you have to be able to lead yourself well. I want you to help me look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, it's time to lead yourself well. Now, the leadership problem in Nigeria, and all the problems in Nigeria, they all point to the need for leadership, the need for people with capacity for problem solving. Because leadership is about problem solving. One of the quickest ways to rise to leadership is problem solving. It's problem solving. Nigeria has a lot of problems, and those are our own opportunities. Those are our own opportunities. This country has immense opportunities, immense potentials that we need to unleash. The devil seems to be covering our eyes and our hearts. Anytime we sit together in groups, we complain. Complaint is the pastime of slaves, not of free people. Can I say that one more time? I said complaint is the pastime of slaves, not of free people. When Israel was moving from you know, slavery to the promised land, their pastime uh, in Egypt was to blame Pharaoh. When they moved to the wilderness, their pastime was to blame Moses. But at the time they told Moses, why don't you take us back to where we're coming from? Yeah. To eat, you know, onion and cucumber in the, this, it's better than all this thing you're giving us. It's, have you noticed that when the average Nigerians gather together, the only thing they do is complain? Yeah. It means that somehow, I know I stand the chance of sounding like I'm being insultive, but that's not the aim at all, that there's still a bit of slavery mindset that makes us to always look for somebody to blame. The moment you blame somebody, you excuse yourself. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. Yeah, you excuse yourself. I know there are people in leadership and they should do something, but uh, the, the right to do something or to make something happen or to solve a problem is not exclusive to them. There's the office of the citizens, which is more powerful, or should be more powerful than the office of the president, where we can decide what we want, what we want to do, and how we want to do it. So I travel the world, I meet Nigerians, and they want me to run a commentary about what's going on in Nigeria. Sometimes I just get tired. Yeah. Because the more you talk, the more powerless you feel, especially when your talk is all about complaining. So you become, you feel so powerless, 
And the devil keeps reinforcing it that that's how it's going to be. You guys are doomed. You're not going to be able to do anything about it. And somehow we accept it. I was speaking here at the Saturday service last night. I know the Holy Spirit just flashed in my mind the Lagos airport or international airport. You know, one of the reasons why, uh, because now I'm beginning to believe that we need, <laughs> I don't know, maybe some special prayers or something like that, because it, it's, it, it's occurring to me that it doesn't take anything to transform an airport or to build a proper airport. But you know what is happening? The devil knows the importance of gateways into a city. Yeah. So when he locks down our major gateways and make them look, you know, terrible, for the want of a better word, it's such that anybody that's coming in will feel there's nothing here. <laughs> yeah. When Nigerians who have been abroad for many years come in, and the first thing they interact with is a decrepit, you know, a, a, a funny looking airport. They feel like, what am I coming to do? Yeah. Somebody says it's a lie of the devil. I cannot hear you. That's the truth. The devil wants to paint a picture that there's nothing here. Run away. They will kill you. Yeah. Remember the story of the spies that Moses sent to check the promised land? They stayed at far and they were checking. And they were overwhelmed. You get to our airport, you come down, you'll be overwhelmed. Yeah. When it blow you. <laughs> when you land that, the, that sometimes there's no power, you know, to bring your bags in, then you just, what kind of thing is this? What kind of country is this? That's where it starts from. Now I've made up my mind. Every time I pass through that airport, I'm prophesying. Yeah. Yeah. Every time I pass through that airport, I will refuse to complain. Yeah. <laughs> I will speak to that, you know, door, gateway to the nation and say, you are blessed and you will be transformed by force. <laughs> yeah. Because very soon, some of us here will build airports. Yeah. Great airports. Yeah. I mean, one man is building a refinery now. So don't think what I'm saying is you know, out of place. Ten years ago, we were complaining about refinery. In a few short years, maybe a couple of years, there will be the biggest refinery in Africa, if not in the world. So what I'm saying is possible. Yeah. Praise God. The problems of Nigeria are our greatest opportunities. We need the right perspective to it. Act 10 and verse 38, the Bible says, Our God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good. Yeah. Who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. The purpose of the anointing is for problem solving. The Nigerian Christian, the African Christian, wants to appropriate the anointing for personal breakthrough. Do you know if this service this morning is an anointing service, anointing for breakthrough, the chair here will not be able to take everybody. Yeah. Because of the deprivation that we have suffered, our attention is so much on ourselves. But the truth is that we need I mean, there's a need for visioning, problem-solving skills. At, you know, the, that need is at all time high currently. We need to catch a new vision for ourselves and for the nation. It's time for us to recalibrate our visions. Yeah. The fact that we're in a nation where vision is not celebrated does not mean that we should be robbed of our capacity to dream and to envision something greater. But one major issue with our nation is that there's no alignment between our individual vision and our collective vision as a people. Yeah. All of us want to break through on our own, if possible to the detriment of the nation. Yeah. To the detriment of the nation. So you have people who have made up their mind 
to steal Niger to rob Nigeria dry, if they, are, they will be okay. Yeah. If they will be okay. My heart broke this morning when I read just on my way to church, punch online about the, the primaries, the national conventions going on of the major parties. And there was one that held somewhere, you know, around the South South. This is Punch, a reliable newspaper. So this is not me talking. They interviewed people who are leaving the convention ground with $9,000 cash in their hand. Go and read it. No, go and read it. When you get to, I mean, this is, I'm talking punch. I'm not talking a blog. Yeah. So this is not a gossip blog. Punch online. Yeah. But they said, somebody said, I wish they would cancel this primary so that they can do another one for us to make more money. <laughs> and this is a delegate. Yeah. One of the candidates came with $3,000 like just for everybody. Now he heard that another candidate was giving 4000 and increased his own to 5000 That's how come somebody can go with 9000 Some people went with more because they collected with, from other delegates. Some people said, it's our national cake. We have come to collect it. That's how we collect it every four years. Yeah. Now, there were 4,000 delegates there. So just think about the dollar rain that happened overnight. And a lot of those people who are candidates don't even have one registered company that is generating that kind of money. So it's our money. Telling you the truth. Yeah. Because one is occupying that office, this one is occupying that office, this one is former this, former that. Yeah. That's where we are. But we can't stay there. Somebody say amen. amen. We can't afford to stay there. We have to do something differently and we have to do it fast. So we have to take our minds away from our sense of personal breakthroughs. If the environment is not enabling, your vision will be hampered. Let's take our minds off how you are going to break through personally. It's important and it's important to you, it's important to this church. I have interest in how you are going to break through personally as your pastor. But I'm saying that after you have broken through, or even while you are thinking of how you break through personally, think about how Nigeria is going to improve because Nigeria's breakthrough have a way of limiting your own breakthrough. A few months ago, if, well, a couple of years ago, maybe a year ago, our currency was devalued officially. And when that happened, everything that you have that was denominated in Naira, assets denominated in Naira was devalued like half. Yeah. Even the richest people in Nigeria that were on the Forbes list, their rating dropped. That was a poverty inflicted on us by the mismanagement of our country. Not because you did anything wrong personally. Am I saying the truth? Yeah. That's how powerful governance and politics is, and policy formulation is. We can't continue to look away. One of the mistakes that the church has made is that the church has refused to see itself as a political system. So the church is losing huge grounds by not recognizing itself as a political system. Spiritual warfare, a lot of it is political context. It's political context. Why do I say that? Real spiritual warfare is not when somebody is being pressed down on the bed. No. Those were jobless demons. <laughs> Just messing around with a Christian that doesn't know it's right. Yeah, you understand? It's like when area boys are harassing you. Yeah, that's, that's what, that's the, that. Those are area boy demons. Real, <laughs> real spiritual warfare is when the devil decides, for instance, that something that is very fundamental to human life is going to be passed into law or going to become, whether you like it or not, a regular order of life around you. For instance, when, uh, um, when they say abortion is legalized 
and anybody can abort, anybody can do anything they like. You know, in America, it's a big deal. You have the pro-life and all that. Or what is happening around the world with the gay right movement, which is completely at variance with the Bible that we believe. Now, make bold to say that. All right? I love everybody, even people with same-sex attraction. There are people I'm counseling now with same-sex attraction. When we put it side by side, the Bible is something to deal with. We can love ourselves through it and help people to overcome it. But to accept it as a way of life, when the Bible says, categorically it's not, is to say that this Bible has become a cake and obsolete. Yeah. And the word of God is infallible. Are you still with me this morning? Yeah. Should we love ourselves? Yes. Should we encourage people with same-sex attraction? Yes. Should we accept as a way of life to negate the details of the Bible? No. But with the stroke of the pen, what I just said now can land me in jail. It's already done in some countries. There are countries that where I cannot say what I'm just saying now. That's what I'm those are that's the real spiritual warfare. When the Bible is, is made to become obsolete, to the point that the next generation will, will, will just throw it away. As, a, as a, 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 a document that doesn't make sense. That's the real spiritual warfare. Now, I also need us to understand this. You see, part of why the church is losing ground politically is that we don't understand that even our faith and Christ came as a political figure. When Jesus was born, the announcement of his birth, what did they say? A king is born. Why do you think Herod was jittery? If they had announced that a prophet was born, he won't make any fuss. But when they said a king has been born, it meant he has to start counting down because that can come to dethrone him. That was why he decided that all hell must be let loose. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. Why did they kill Jesus? It was not because he was healing people. It was not because of, it was because they said he called himself the king of the Jews. And when he stood before Pilate, are you the king of the Jews? He said, you said so. <laughs> That's the main thing. And if you said he's a king, that means he's, he said, I'm interested in politics. I'm interested in how governance will be drawn so that the life of the people can be transformed. You see, Jesus, when Jesus was here, just, uh, and just like it's still happening today, people get healed and all that. Yeah. But you know, if Jesus was here right now, you need to take what I want to say carefully. If Jesus was here right now, he would do his utmost best to make sure that the resources of this nation is used to research prevention of sickness. So you won't have to lay hands on too many people. He would rather fight for that than be counting the number of people healed. Yeah. He would rather invest the resources of a nation in the discovery of drugs. The Bible says that Christ has been made to us the wisdom of God and the power of God. The church in Africa has only known the power dimension of Jesus to the detriment of the wisdom dimension of Jesus. The wisdom dimension of God is interested in research, in disease control, disease prevention, and discovery of drugs that will wipe out a disease wholesale. You know what we do in church when we pray? We are dealing with it in retail. Some, some people don't understand that the Bible says all knowledge is from God. The secret things belong to God. The things that are revealed belong to us and our children. Yeah. It is the, to the glory of, uh, of God to conceal a matter. The Bible says the honor of the king to search them out. When we discover a, a cure for diseases, it's still God. It's never willing that disease will finish us. Yeah. 
but it takes a concerted effort. It takes political will sometimes. It takes a lot of resources for those things to be done. This nation has massive resources that can deliver the whole of Africa. Yeah. You know, the movie Black Panther is a prophecy. Yeah, it's a prophecy. See that vibranium thing? It's a spiritual phenomenon. It's in our DNA. We have to bring it out. Yeah. If you haven't watched the movie, go and watch it. <laughs> yeah. We have to pray that vibranium out. Yeah. Because Africa is set to rule the world. Say amen, somebody. Yeah. Finally today, I need us to understand that we need to play our part. Yeah. We need to play our part. Matthew 16 and verse 18. Jesus talking to Peter. Blessed are you, you know, Simon, Simon answered and said to him, you are the Christ, so go, go, go to verse 18 for me, verse 18, 18, that's what I want. Jesus answered and said to him, he said, and also I said to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. When he says the gate of hell, he wasn't talking about a physical gate, a metal gate or something. He's talking about the decision-making bodies of hell. The gates in the days that Jesus said this was a place where decision makers sat. In Proverbs 31 and verse 23, the Proverbs 31 woman was praised that her husband sits at the gate of the city. Proverbs 31 and, and, and verse 23, where the elders of the land, yeah, said her husband is known in the gate where he sits among the elders of the land. Yeah. The gate of hell the decision making body of hell. They are interested in the decision making body of every nation until we bring kingdom values to the gates of Nigeria. We will not be able to rescue Nigeria. Yeah. We will not be able to rescue Nigeria. So it's extremely important that we understand that and choose to work in it. Moses, David, Joseph, Daniel, Esther got into the politics of their time to solve national problems and not only their individual problems. The church in Nigeria, you and I need to come to terms with the fact that God is interested in our individual breakthroughs, but much more than that, he wants our nation to change. And he's counting on us to make it happen. He's counting on us to make it happen. He's counting on us to make it happen. Jesus is interested in the politics of every nation. Because he cares about the spiritual and the physical needs of the people. Yeah. He cares about it seriously. There's an element of financial prosperity and quality of life that is extremely dependent on politics and governance. For instance, you know, if this nation should change the way we're praying, 60 to 70% of your prayer points will change. Some of the ones you're praying now will be obsolete. When we run a credit system, as tricky as it can become, the only thing that is guaranteed is that you can't be praying for food in the morning when you have a credit card that gives you a credit limit of $1,000 or $2,000. The least is that you use your credit card. When we have a welfare system for the underprivileged, many people will no longer be on our roads begging because at least they can access social welfare. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. When we have affordable housing, which should be something that is championed by, you know, a government, many people will not be on the road. If you have a job, a good job, you won't pray, God, give me a house. You just get a mortgage, 2%. Pay for 20 years, 25 years. Yeah. I don't know if you are getting what I'm saying. That's why I said, Nigeria changes, a lot of your prayer points will disappear. Yeah. Or they will change. They will become something else. Praise God. Let's wrap it all up. Ways to be involved. The first thing in ways to be involved is pray. First Timothy 2, 1 to 3. 
So therefore, supplication, prayers, intercession should be made for everyone in authority, for kings, you know, for all men, for kings, and all who in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Prayer. We should never get tired of praying. Secondly, register to vote. Your influence is neutralized if you can't vote. Get your PVC. Now, the Get Your PVC campaign is the least we can do because it positions us at the finish line. We need to get involved from the back end. So our campaign should change, really, from Get Your PVC to join a political party and become a card-carrying member. It doesn't matter whether you want to vie for office or not. What is most important is that you want to participate in the value chain before it gets to the end. This past week, uh, the major parties in Lagos selected or voted for the people that they want to run for office as governor of Lagos State. If I say, any, if there's anybody here that voted in any of those parties, can you lift your hand? Let me see, please. You voted in any of those parties. I can only see one hand in that corner there. Yeah. We are about 2,000 adults here right now, if not more. There's only one hand there. See, shame on us. I can't say anything better than that, than shame on us. Because we, <laughs> we create time for every other thing apart from the most important thing. Yeah. As you leave the service this morning, I want you to actually think about what I'm saying. Maybe get this message, go online if you can, you know, get the CD. Listen to it over and again until we get to understand how these things impact on us. We're not going to change. We are too fixated on my job, my this, my that. And one policy of government can wipe out your industry, not just your job. Is, is it not when there's industry that you can work? Yeah. Yeah. Can wipe out a whole industry. Because when there's problem with political leadership, governance, and one industry is going down, there's massive layoff. Where does that leave us? And we're always busy. We don't want to participate. Let me tap your neighbor say, wake up. Let me tell somebody else, say, wake up. Excel in whatever you do. Do it well. It will give you credibility and influence which can be leveraged if you want to go into politics. If you're a banker, be a solid one. If you're a lawyer, be a solid one. If you're in business, be a reputable businessman. Yeah. And do well for yourself, as in Try to build credibility. You, you will leverage on it one day if God is directing you to be in politics. Engage in community projects. So do practical things to meet the needs of people around you. There's a man that used to live see where I grew up in Ibadan, you know, your state. It was called the Amala politics man. All the time that he did Amala politics. Yeah, if you don't know what it is, ask somebody, they will tell you. It worked. Somebody came and scaled it up and called it stomach infrastructure. And it worked for him. It means that people are always looking out for people who will meet their needs. As a church, we do a lot of that. Medical outreach, feed the poor, all that. You do your own. It gives a level of influence and believability to the point that people want to follow you because we still have a lot of people who need help who are you helping if we don't have a track record in helping anybody don't get into politics you don't have any business there yeah you have to get you have to cut your teeth in helping people yeah starting from your family to different people those are the things that you eventually leverage if god is leading you into politics but i'm saying do it Without, with or without any political ambition. Those are the ways we contribute to the betterment of our nation. And finally, give financially to office-seeking politicians. Support credible candidates seeking office. Whoever pays the piper will dictate the tune. We cannot continue to complain 
that political godfathers are the ones ruling us and all that and all that. They make the big money available. Yeah. A lot of young people going to politics now are doing crowdfunding. And some of us are doing, doing like this to them. Where will they get the money from? They can't succeed, all that. If we continue like that, the story, the narrative remains the same. Yeah. 1,000 naira from everybody, 5,000 naira from everybody, 10,000 naira from everybody. To one credible candidate can be a game changer. I'm just trying to be practical. Can be a game changer. Personally, I've supported all my friends who have vied, vied for office in, in, at any time. I mean, a lot of them just send me a message, oh, this, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm talking about people I believe in. Not all of them have won. I don't consider my money wasted when they don't win. And I'm talking about my personal funds, not church funds. Yeah? I need to clarify that. Yeah. My personal money transferred from my account for the sake of record. Yeah. I don't give cash. I transfer money. And I do it boldly because it's my, it's my money and it's my choice what I do with it. Yeah. Yeah. I have people contesting you know, in different places who are my personal friends I've known for years. Some schoolmates just get in touch with me, pass on contesting, any support will be good. Send 20,000, send 50,000. Yeah, it's my money. I believe in them. I've known them for years. I know what it stands for. Yeah. You need to do the same. Because I'm not preaching what I'm not doing. You need to do the same. That's how credible people will get in here and there, will spring surprises, and before you know it, it may take us 10 years, it may take us 20 years but we will overturn this system that is not working. In the name of Jesus. Are you blessed this morning? I want you to put your hands together. Let's celebrate Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you for listening. We hope you are truly blessed. Please feel free to email us at info at elevationng.org for all inquiries or to share any testimonies. You can also follow us on our social media channels at elevationng. To have access to real-time updates on all broadcasts and special programs. Till we come your way again, keep making greatness common.